So I think fundamentally, because we launched Panel V1 in 2021, and it wasn't, it wasn't the best product. It was the fact that the product was difficult and complex. It was overwhelming for users to utilize the V1, and we recognized that. So a good part of last year was actually going back to the whiteboard to redesign the protocol, the underlying mechanics, while retaining the principal direction, which is to enable fixed rates for, for users in DeFi. Hey everyone, welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad from Fourth Revolution Capital, and I'm here with my co-host from 4RC Nomadic. In this episode, we'll cover Pendle Finance, a DeFi yield trading protocol. Pendle aims to reimagine the TradFi interest derivative market worth over 400 trillion in notional value as a trustless money Lego, where anyone in DeFi can execute yield strategies such as earning fixed yield and longing the staff yield rate. But before we do, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Whether you're a trader, farmer, analyst, or newbie, you can trade smart with KyberSwap, the OG decentralized exchange and aggregator on 13 chains. Swap at the best rates, farm with real yields, set limit orders, use their proprietary trading and AI tools with the best UX in DeFi, securely and permissionlessly. Get better rates, better opportunities, better alpha, and a better trading experience. Trade smart now at kyberswap.com. Welcome to Mantle Network Mainnet. Mantle Network, the flagship product of Mantle Ecosystem, is a high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 network that brings scalability, security, and affordability to the forefront under a modular design. We're constantly growing and expanding. Since the launch of Testnet, Mantle Network has enabled a significant gas fee reduction for L2 transactions by up to 70% by adopting EigenDA technology. We also seamlessly integrated fraud proofs and concluded external audits on the code base. Together with its extensive ecosystem partners and hundreds of thousands of builders and community members, Mantle, powered by its native token, MMT, is committed to enabling the mass adoption of decentralized and token-governed technologies. You can now explore a multitude of projects already deployed on Mantle Network, from gaming to DeFi and beyond. Call in Web3 entrepreneurs to accelerate their project growth with the Mantle Grants program. The time is now. Join us to be part of the decentralized revolution. Hey everyone, my name is Kaido. I'm a co-founder at Utopia Labs. And today we're really, really excited to be announcing and launching a feature called USDC Bank Transfers. We're basically allowing for any company based anywhere in the world to be able to send USDC to any US bank account, whether that US bank account is a US citizen or a person who might have something as simple as a WISE account. If we zoom out since a year ago, there's been a chokehold on kind of the interoperability and seamlessness between traditional rails and crypto rails. We put a a lot of time and effort into this to be able to provide a smooth end experience for you as a consumer or as a company using crypto and using traditional financial world. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts, and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains in USDC. And native access to Instadap's powerful, custom DeFi strategies. Avocado, one wallet to rule all chains. All right, in just a moment, we'll introduce Tian Li, the co-founder of Pendle Finance. He is one of the few people I can think of who have been building full-time in DeFi since 2017, being a founding team member of the Foundational Liquidity Protocol at Kyber Network. He was also an early contributor to Wrapped Bitcoin, the most popular form of tokenized BTC today, with over $4.7 billion in tokenized Bitcoin liquidity on Ethereum and other L1s and L2s. So let's kick it off. Tien, welcome to the Edge Podcast. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, just it's a real pleasure to finally get to talk with you, not just about Pendle, but you are one of the most like OG DeFi builders in the space. Um, for folks that are newer to DeFi, 
I think it's worth noting that Kyber is truly like one of the earliest purest form of DeFi that was being developed going back to 2017. And a lot of what we enjoy today in DeFi derives from work that your team was doing uh, back in the day. But Tian, do you want to share just a bit more about your journey in crypto? Like maybe what led to you getting started with Kyber and then ultimately moving over here to Pendle Finance? Yeah, of course. I think along the way, I got really lucky, but everything started with a research project for a professor back in 2014. And that really got me intrigued with the whole cryptocurrency technology. So I remember I was tasked to look into various business models in the fintech sector. And one of the companies involved was using Bitcoin to remit money from Singapore to the Philippines. And I thought that was a very, very interesting proposition to users because they were offer they were able to offer the same service at a fraction of the cost. So that had me looking deeper into the whole technology. And also coincidentally at that point in time, Ethereum was getting more traction. Um, and then I went to read up on the Ethereum white paper. Um, I think fast forward, I was working, like building up the, because I wasn't technical and I figured like I needed a way to be involved in the sector. And the only way that I could contribute was to manage communities. So I set up Ethereum Singapore Facebook community and had to look through many different types of resources to share with the community. And so have to come across a white paper called Oyante which was co-authored by Loy. Reach out to him because he was a couple of bus stops away from me. And we became friends. And then fast forward, uh, when he started out Kyber in 2017, we had a conversation. He asked if I'd be open to join the team to head the business development unit and the community building site. And I agreed to it. So it turned out to be one of the most pivotal decisions that I've made because that got me started in crypto professionally. And in, it opened up a lot of doors for me personally to be introduced to really, really int intelligent and capable people and all the different people who have become also very important to the founding of uh, Pendle eventually. Now, so I, 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 I stayed on in Kyber until 2019, early 2019. And then following that, I decided to take a step back and really start to explore different opportunities in and out of the crypto sector. So I get that a group of people who are now co-founders of Pendle to work on a string of very unsuccessful ventures, um, starting with like mining software to farm uh, privacy coins. We also did uh, something around uh, data engineering. So that, that had a little, a, a little bit more successes. Uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't anything major. Um, so 2019, 2020 period, it was a relatively difficult time for us because we haven't been able to construct a product that had product market fit. Uh, and we had to figure out ways to make like little money here and there to try to get through that, 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 that period. Um, and DeFi summer happened to be one of the best things to happen to us. We were farming tokens and all this foot coins were giving out like thousands of percent of APYs. And as much as we liked the idea of capturing all these APYs, it also occurred to us that there was no good way for us to lock in the rates. We knew that the APYs were fleeting, but there was nothing that we could do about it. And then when we contrasted what was in DeFi at that point in time to a mature financial sector, it just occurred to us that fixed rate, fixed income products are some of the most important verticals in the financial sector, and it was largely missing in crypto. And we figured that, you know, coming from our own perspective, that innately, because as individuals, we value certainty, and we thought that that was something that we wanted, and it was absent in crypto. And we feel that we felt that most other people other than us would also value that product. So we decided to start ideating around the 
solution to offer fixed income products to, to, to the crypto sector. So that was basically, I think, the motivation of starting Pendle. Tian, what, why do you think DeFi fixed income or fixed yield uh, has struggled in terms of adoption? I think um, in a bull market, when we introduced the product, because I think in general, the risk appetite of most crypto natives is, is quite different. Um, most of us who are relatively native to crypto have higher tolerance for risk. And we wouldn't be too bothered about locking in like say 5%, 10% even in a bull market, especially because if you lock in 10%, you're probably missing out the opportunity to gain 20, 30% or even 100% APY. So I think at that point in time in a bull market, a lot of individuals would favor higher APYs and had higher risk tolerance because those were real opportunities to generate wealth. But I think times are changing, especially uh, now in a, in a relatively inactive period within crypto, um, to be able to lock in rates at say five, six percent happens to be quite attractive as a proposition. And beyond that, I think there's with more capital inflow into the crypto sector, I believe that the awareness for fixed income products in a certain user's portfolio will become increasingly important. Again, because innately, I believe most individuals value that certainty. Uh, and I think there is a price to certainty. Tian, I really like what you said there as far as kind of the behavior of DeFi actors in a bull versus a bear. I want to come back to that later because I think that's important. And I totally, I totally get what you're saying. Like, yeah, in the bull, there's just way more risk-taking appetite and people are almost willing to forego maybe a smaller fixed fixed rate. Um, but yeah, we, we should definitely get into that later. But, but first, I kind of want to just get into Pendle a little bit. In the intro, we mentioned Pendle is a yield trading protocol. And in the Pendle docs, you say, we give users the reins to their yield. What do you mean by that? And what can we do on the Pendle protocol? So I think yield is one of the biggest items within crypto, DeFi. And today, I am of the impression that a lot of users are quite familiar with the whole notion of yield-bearing assets. So for example, STETH, Stargate USDT, AUSDC, these are all yield-bearing assets. And the, the reason for these assets to... Uh, to exist in the first place is like maybe two purposes, right? Like number one, it functions as a proof of deposit into a certain pool. And then secondly, it functions as a receipt for the yield that is accrued from the underlying protocol. So when the way we look at it, like with all these yield bearing assets conventionally, aside from just like the principal value, there's also the yield that is accruing all the time and these are value that is, I mean, this is a value that is locked within the asset. So we believe that by splitting up the value uh, coming from the yield, uh, accrued yield uh, from the underlying asset, we can open up more opportunities um, for, for users to do more, um, whether it's to long or short yield or to lock in the fixed rates. So Tian, I want to start to break down the major components that make up the Pendle protocol. Um, one of those you started to touch upon there, which is yield tokenization, that concept of a principal token versus a yield token. Um, so could we start to talk then about, in terms of the yield tokenization, how do we use that as users? And, and I'm hoping we could start with Pendle Earn. I feel like that's the simplest easiest use case um, for those of us who are new to the Pendle protocol? So with regards to Pendle, um, so Pendle's source of liquidity is actually yield-bearing assets. Um, so yield-bearing assets like STETH, Stargate USDT, um, AUSDC, any kind of asset that generates yield, when you deposit into Pendle, the outcome would be one principal token and one yield token. So the principal token, in short for PT, represents the principal component of a yield-bearing asset, 
while the yield token, the YT, accrues the yield that is paid up from the underlying protocol. So as an example, if the underlying protocol is Lido, the YT will accrue the yield in the form of SDETH. Now, these two assets, after separated, they can be traded independently of each other. So the PT side is actually structured quite similarly to that of a zero coupon bond in, the, in which like it, it is priced at a discount relative to the underlying, in this case, the STETH. Um, and at maturity, it, will be redeem, it can be redeemed uh, for the underlying par. And then on the other hand, the yield token, YT, right, will continue to accrue interest uh, or, or the yield that is paid out from the underlying protocol. It realizes it as and when the yield is paid out. And then at maturity, it will become zero dollar in value because by then it will no longer accrue any kind of yield. So this is, I think, a very important relationship between the YT and PT that we need to establish. And ultimately, right, with Pendle, one PT, the, 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 the value of one PT plus the value of one YT has to equal to the value of one underlying. And in this case, right, because of this entire relationship, PT and YT are inversely related, meaning to say, if PT price goes up, YT price has to come down or vice versa. One of the more popular pools on Pendle has been uh, the staked ETH pools. And so you have different maturities depending on when folks watch this. Hopefully they're watching this long into the future. But uh, given that we're midway through 2023, we have maturity dates that take us out to uh, the end of 2023 and then out even further, like let's say almost a year, year and a half. Um, and so if I were to go to the Pendle Earn ap application and I've got one stack and I want to um, earn a, a fixed rate with with that staff. Can you explain when I use Pendle Earn, what happens under the hood? Am I buying uh, PT tokens or are we minting PT and YT? Yeah, sure. I should have got, got like gone there. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, that's, don't, don't worry. I was just struggling last night to think about how to ask you that question. So much harder to actually answer the question. So, so Pendle Earn is actually, I think, I, I think it will help to give a bit more context as to why we construct Pendle Earn. Because when we started our Pendle V2 end of last year, right, we had, we know the product is complex. So that means we need to do something about the UI UX. And the initial implementation for V2 involves a simple UI and a pro UI. So the pro UI is like what you're seeing right now on the trade page. Simple UI has already been replaced by Pedal Earth. But the simple UI, um, at that point in time when it was out, the narrative around it was actually to buy asset at a discount. How it works is basically users buy PT, like um, zero coupon, and then hold it until maturity and then redeem it par uh, for the underlying. So that's that's kind of how, how it works. So you buy, for example, 95 cents, for USDC, and then at maturity, you redeem the full USDC at one dollar, and that's the, the 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 five cent difference is your gain. So, um, we realized like a couple of things when we have the simple UI as the like with the asset at the discount as the narrative. Two things, right? The first observation is that when we have asset at a discount, the natural follow-up question is, where does the discount come from? And then we realize that we have to go through the the whole like uh, relatively complex explanation of how like Pendle works. And then secondly, which is a very important one, is that like crypto community is a lot more familiar with the whole concept of APY versus discount. Because one involves like putting money in and then at, at some point in time further down, you take more money out. Whereas like asset at a discount is you put less money in and then at maturity, you pull, you, you take the full amount out. So, I mean, structurally and, and maybe from perspectives, different perspectives, they are somewhat similar, but framing wise, they are very, very different. So we decided to drop that narrative, prime it as an earned product, structure it like a fixed deposit that I think a lot of users are familiar with. 
and and really try to minimize the learning curve. So with Panel Earn, at the back of it, it's basically just users buying the principal token and then holding it until maturity and redeem it for the underlying for the for the fixed game. So it is really as simple as that. Um, but how the yields, the the percentage of uh, yield is derived is a result of the yield trading that happens on the other side. Again, because like PT, YT are inversely related. So when PT, uh, these two cannot, like they have to exist together. It's just that when the demand for PT increases, that, that there will be opportunities for YT because the price of YT has to come down. So this is where the traders can come in, speculate on the yield token. And then, yeah, if, if, if users think, if, if traders think that uh, there is a potential for the yield token to grow even more in value in the coming three months, six months or so, then they can express a view there by buying the YT. And as a result of that, it changes the implied yield, which determines the, the, the fixed rates. Tian, that trader part is super interesting too, and something I also want to get into a bit more. Um, I've been seeing on crypto Twitter some of these like the greatest trades ever, you know, done on Pendle. Um, we, we definitely want to ask you about those, but um, I want to ask you kind of about another component of Pendle. So we've talked about Earn, um, we've talked about about the yield tokenization, but I guess after those steps are done, what 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 happens on the Pendle AMM? How do like how do people provide liquidity to it, and what sort of I guess yields and and where are those yields coming from to the liquidity providers on the Pendle AMM? So in terms of the yield, I think I I'll start with the yield first. So the yield um, for liquidity providers it, com it it's composed of multiple sources. So again, taking um, I think taking Stargate USDT as an example. So when a user deposit Stargate USDT into Pendle, um, the Pendle, Pendle AMM actually has some sort of a module to tabulate the reward that is paid out from the underlying protocol, which in this case is Stargate. So as a liquidity provider, the user is entitled to Stargate SDG reward, the lending APY from Stargate, and then on top of that, the Pendle incentives and the fixed yield within the Pendle, um, fix you within the, the, of the PT component and the swap fees. So collectively, there are multiple sources of yield and, and that, that results like the stacking of yield makes it more appealing for liquidity providers to deposit asset into the Pendle pool. Now, how, how it's done is actually pretty straightforward. It's just like any other AMM pool like Uniswap or uh, Trader Joe. Deposit asset, um, I mean, first of all, I go to the page, right? And then select the pool. Like again, in this case, Stargate USDT. Choose the maturity of choice and then deposit the asset. Uh, in this case, you could deposit something as close to the, um, close to the asset in consideration like USDT. Or if you have only Ether, you can deposit Ether, but it will have to be swapped to USDT first before it gets deposited into the pool. So we allow for the zap-in option. Uh, and then for, importantly, I think for traders or users with a more sizable position, it helps to select the zero price impact mode when they provide liquidity into the pool. Because in, in, in some sense, right, the zero price impact mode takes away the, the swapping uh, involved um, into the pool and, and mint the YT and PT, pair them up um, in proportion and then add, add, add the assets into the pool. Zepin is probably the simpler way to do it. I basically went through like the very manual steps. Yeah, TM, that's what I'm wondering is for those who are newer, who then move beyond uh, uh, Pendle Earn, what are the more popular uh, strategies? Uh, so... I know I was personally looking at whether to zap into one of these pools. Like I was looking at the uh, one of the Steph pools that let's say it, the, the one that expires in December 2023 
And I was thinking, all right, I could provide yield with my staff plus the, uh, plus the, would it be the PT token that I'm ultimately holding? Actually, let, let's, let's just talk about that. If I was going to zap into one of the pools, what happens under the hood and what am I ultimately exposed to? Cause I, th I think the goal for many is to remain exposed to the underlying asset. In this example, it's staff. Um, so they're, they're, they're just wanting to earn more, st more staff or more ETH at the end of the day. Um, can they do that by getting into an LP like that? Or is there some sort of risk that they could walk away with less ETH than what they started? So with regards to the example, so say a user has, um, staff pool, uh, sorry, staff asset, right? Um, and the user the easiest way I think any user can participate in in Pendle to earn APY is to become a liquidity provider. So the the way to go about it is to look at the pool and the duration of 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 choice, and then deposit STETH into the pool. So what happens at the back is STETH will a portion of it, let's say fifty fifty, right? So. It's a 50-50 pool, and the pool will consist of two assets. First is the principal token of STETH, and then the second asset is STETH, um, but wrapped in the EIP-5115 format. So we call this like the uh, super composable yield or short for, um, like in short, like SY um, token format. So PT, again, PT STETH, again, it's STETH in SY token format. So when you deposit STETH into the pool, half of that gets converted, traded against the pool and gets converted into PT. And then the other half remains as STETH, but wrapped into SY, paired together, and then deposited into the pool. Now, because I, I, I think because the assets, uh, PT is a derivative of the STETH, they are very, very highly correlated. And from our studies, the because of the high correlation of the assets in the pool. So in general, the impermanent loss of the assets um, like of, of becoming an LP is actually quite negligible. And importantly, right, because PT at maturity is redeemed, can be redeemed for the underlying par. So at maturity, all the assets in the pool will actually have the same value. So fundamentally, right, if you are a liquidity provider, and you deposit asset into the pool, and you hold it until maturity, you will you will have zero impermanent loss. And I think this is one of the more important points for user. So if you're comfortable with 2024 pool, uh, for example, and you since you already long ETH, uh, and then depositing into the 2024 pool, hold it until maturity, just for additional APY, could be quite 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 attractive. Tian, I want to ask you just about some of these trades I, I mentioned earlier, um, and I don't know if I don't know if you're familiar with this one, but I'll I'll, I'll lay it out for you. And um, so the one I saw was it involved like I think it was ten about ten thousand dollars worth of capital, earning yield on a three hundred and twenty thousand dollar position. And I, I honestly I read the tweet, and I still don't know if I fully understand it, but just wondered if you could maybe lay out a bit of what was happening there at, at a high level way and and maybe describe kind of that opportunity that may exist for other opportunistic traders or users of Pendle. Um, yeah, just walk us through that. Of course. Yeah. So um, again, let's go back to the, to the relationship between PT and YT and the underlying. So one PT plus one YT has to equal to the value of one underlying. So effectively, right? Let's just say that in this case, the underlying is, uh, I'm, I'm going to use like US dollar because it's easiest to represent. So this you uh, this is the underlying is one US dollar, one USDC, for example, and the published yield is 5%. So the YT price should be, I mean, like uh, for simplicity's sake, 5 cents. And then... As a result of that, the PT is 95 cents. So 95 cents plus 5 cents to a dollar. So effectively, right, because of the nature of YT, 
it represents a much smaller part of a yield bearing asset. And because of that, right, a five, like say a five and a half ETH yield exposure is actually representing a much bigger notional amount. Um, just, just imagine, right, if you have like a dollar, you can now buy 20 YTs uh, of 5%. Um, so you, you, you are like with 20 YTs, you're effectively getting an implied leverage of 20 times, right? So this is why uh, with, with the strategy that, that you mentioned, even though the initial amount is only maybe around 10, 10 grand, it represents a notional value of 300 something thousand dollars because YT is a much smaller component of a yield bearing asset. Um, yeah, and, and the same amount of capital gives you a much bigger lever. And this is uh, very different from taking a levered position at other values because here you are actually just buying the yield component of a yield bearing asset. So you are, you're, this is a spot transaction. There is no margin account involved. And this sort of implied leverage basically means that you cannot be liquidated. Do you think you could address uh, challenges with balancing uh, y YT and PT given the fact that YT is uh, so much more, uh, I'm trying to think of what's the best way to like say this, like capital efficient. Yeah. Yeah. Like what fascinated me with YT is that you can, you can buy for an, a, an insignificant amount of money relative to what the PT is. And you can ultimately capture that yield. And I think I'm probably not doing the best job of it. I think what I'm saying frames up why that trade was so epic that someone used such a smaller amount of money and is now earning yield in this case on like a, like a three hundred thousand dollar position and instead. So it's it's getting leverage without the risk of uh, liquidation. It's getting leverage on yield, which is really just not available in other forms in DeFi. Like this is a very uh, unique use case. Sure. I, I think like this is definitely one of the more unique propositions of Pendle because as a trader who intends to speculate on the yield movement, I think Pendle is probably one of the most capital efficient ways to do it. And in regards to this particular aspect that you brought up, we have actually, after speaking with some of our bigger users, um, one of the common feedback is they find it very difficult to do the YT trade in bigger size. So again, because let's say like a 20K worth of YT represents maybe 300K, 400K of uh, the underlying, if they were to do say 50K of uh, YT trade size, it's going to represent a much bigger notional value. And that means the price impact that they would incur is going to be quite significant because it's going to take up a pretty sizable portion of the liquidity pool. So here, I think there is a limitation to how much the AMM can process without incurring the price impact. And we are keenly aware that this is potentially a bottleneck for the Pendle protocol uh, because it, 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 it kind of inhibits more sophisticated traders from t trading in bigger, bigger sizes. So moving forward, this is going to be one of the areas that we need to improve on. And the trading experience is going to be prioritized. So one of the features that we will be releasing in the coming quarters uh, would be, yeah, an RFQ limit order system to allow users to put up the, the YT um, orders um, and, and, and the price that they are willing to, to execute the transaction for. Oh, that's really interesting. That's exciting. Do you know how soon that might, that might release? You were saying in the coming months or so? Yeah. So timeline wise, I think it would be premature for me to indicate any concrete timeline, but this is definitely one of the features that we're more excited about. Uh, just to take a step back from that, uh, can you dumb down for us 
where does the liquidity for buying yield tokens come from? If we were going to long the, the yield token, this like degen trade that we've talked about, um, the one that this person executed, uh, yeah, where again does that yield or where again does that liquidity come from? Yeah, so the liquidity is also coming from the same pool, the PT against the SY, the underlying. So here, I think one of the more important innovations that we've introduced the panel V2 is to consolidate the liquidity to one pool and at the same time, enable the, uh, the, the, the trading of PT and YT. So effectively, we can do without the YT pool because of the inverse relationship between PT and YT. So for example, um, yeah, again, like if, 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 um, there is a, a demand for YT, what happens at the back of it is the, there's going to be a flash swap to borrow some assets from the pool to mint YT or, or, or burn YT, um, for, for the transaction. So, uh, if I, if I want to buy YT. I will transact against, I will trade against the same pool, but because the pool currently does not have any YT in place, the pool will have to mint YT uh, by using the amount that I deposited, mint YT, uh, and then give me the, um, the, the proportional amount of YT that I'm entitled to based on the amount that I've input. And then the rest of the PT that is minted as a result, as a byproduct of the intention to purchase YT, gets deposited back into the pool. So this process, I think, is a little more difficult to explain without visual aid, but I'm just going to keep it as that. So the liquidity pool is the same, uh, and, and it's, again, more capital efficient compared to the V1 inter, uh, implementation. Uh, and and, and the, where it takes place is also on the trade page on Pendle app. So if a user goes to the application, there will be two columns on the right. One indicates PT, the other one indicates YT. So click on the YT button and the user will be directed to the page to swap the YT. One component we haven't talked about yet that I think we should touch on um, is vPendle and how it's utilized with, within the protocol. Can you maybe discuss this boosting mechanism? Pendle, as the native asset, does not have any kind of utility, but it can be locked up for vPendle, uh, and the locking duration is anywhere between one week and two years. So with vPendle, there are three utilities. The first is as a yield booster. So for example, if you're a liquidity provider within Pendle, and you have a vPendle position, you are entitled to some yield boosting and the yield boosting factor goes as high as two and a half times. That's first. And then secondly, as a VE panel holder, you are entitled to votes of the incentive, incentive emissions. So every week there is a budget that can be utilized for liquidity incentive. So you as a VE panel holder can decide on the distribution of the, emis uh, of the emission to the pool of your choice. Uh, and the third is, is as a claim to the protocol revenue. So, and this protocol revenue is not, is not that immediate. And it, you would have to, as a, as a VPedal holder, you would have to vote for a certain pool to be entitled, uh, to be entitled to the, um, the portion of the protocol revenue. So for example, um, I vote for the STE pool and the the amount of revenue that the SDE pool accrues gets distributed back to me if I uh, only after I've voted. I think this segues kind of nicely into something I've been seeing play out. Um, if if people are familiar with the DefiWars.xyz site, um, that's a great site. You should go check it out. But we've seen these protocols emerge. Uh, one's called Equilibria. The other one's called PenPy. And they seem to be buying up large amounts of the Pendle token. I think last time I checked, they collectively owned around 51 or 52% of the Pendle token. Why are they doing this? So um, I think they, with, with, uh, with the vPendle, that presents an opportunity for new protocols to be built on top. Um, I think on the one hand, it's definitely 
there is there is um, a group of users who wish to provide liquidity to the protocol, but don't necessarily want the token exposure, because in order to get boosted reward, they would have to lock up Pendle for a duration, in order to get like the maybe a maximum of two and a half times booster, right? But some some trading shops might not be ready for that because. Uh, they just want the yield, maximum yield without the token exposure. And then on the other hand, there's a group of Pendle token holders who um, want to generate more APY on, on their the Pendle. So um, here, these protocols like Equilibrium and PenPy, they're basically created to enable these two types of needs to be uh, to, to, to cater to each other. So on the one hand, they aggregate more users who are pedal holders and, and, and for them to deposit into the protocol. And then on the other hand, they can function as a uh, protocol for, for liquidity provisions um, with, with uh, added benefits because of the pedal that they have accrued. Uh, and then collectively, I think this is one of the ecosystems that we are currently cultivating because ultimately they provide a lot of benefits to the uh, to the Pendle protocol and they have also contributed quite a sizable amount of TVL to Pendle protocol. Tian, I, I want to reflect now on the insane growth that Pendle has had this year. So since January 1st, 2023, I was looking back at the total value locked on Pendle was around 15 million in, in US dollars. And that has 10 x uh, in the last six to seven months to 150 million. And then even if we measure that in ETH, uh, given the fact that crypto has done actually relatively well this year in 2023, uh, it's 7x up in terms of uh, valuing that in ETH. What do you attribute to this success? When we started the bear market, you were still struggling with product market fit, as we noted with like DeFi fixed yields. And and now there seems to be a, a, a very active user base. There's a very engaged community there, a community that's very vocal too about like how valuable this utility is. So what what is it? What's the magic sauce in, in what you've all done here in the past year and a half? Yeah, I don't think there's a lot of uh, magic involved, but definitely a lot of luck. So I think fundamentally, because we launched Pendle V1 in 2021, and it wasn't it wasn't the best product, put it this way. There were a lot of... We, we received a lot of feedback. And most of the time, it's very consistent. It was the fact that the product was difficult and complex. And it was overwhelming for users to utilize the V1. And we recognized that. So a good part of last year was actually going back to the whiteboard to redesign the protocol, the underlying mechanics, while retaining the principal direction, which is to enable fixed rates for, for users in DeFi. So having, having that in mind, we spent a lot of time to think about how to optimize the AMM, um, the U, 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 UX, um, and, and also like the longer term roadmap that we wanted to construct. So with the launch of Pendle V2, with other than the product, we also experimented a number of different narratives. So I think like being ready to accept that some things just don't necessarily work out the way we intend to, that mindset is quite important, especially in the bear market, because a lot of times we experimented with things and we are ready to accept that they will not always work out and we're okay with that. So we, with, with that said, like with the different types of narratives, we attempted, for example, asset at a discount that wasn't that successful. And then we also attempted to associate our brand with ApeCoin by launching an ApeCoin compounder and also an ApeCoin market on Pendle. That was okay, but after a while, with the uh, fading of the hype around a point, we also saw like uh, dwindling activity in the pool. 
and similarly for looks rare as well. And then uh, when we were trading at like $10 billion in FTV, we were seeding the low cap gem um, narrative. And with some influencers, we also pitch the idea of the potential of yield trading in crypto um, by comparing to the interest rate swap market in, in TradFi. So, but effectively, I think these didn't work out. The ones that stood out after several attempts was actually LSD5. So we figured out ways to insert ourselves into that whole narrative. Um, and basically, we provided the venue for users to express a view on the ETH, ETH staking yield. And this was all before the Shanghai Fork. So we were able to capitalize on the hype around this particular narrative and then work with partners like Aura, Balancer, and Rocket Pool to establish pools that really allowed users to express a view. So that was like our first breakthrough, I think. And then, of course, with GLP, we saw even more traction because there was a very, there's there's always been a very core uh, trader community within GMX. And then given that the rate refreshes once a week, we also, we, we offered a venue for the, the, the traders to long or short GMX yield. Um, so I think like we have been very, very fortunate to be able to capture some of these trends and and uh, build on top of these. I will say I do not think there is any luck involved here. I, I think you abstracted away the complexity of the protocol. This is something that, as, as someone who is following Pendle from a distance, and I, I had written up at least one or two tutorials, probably for the Defiant at the time, when I came back to the application and I started seeing like all the changes made, like, long discounted tokens, I was like, whoa, that just dumbs down all of the other complexity that I had spent time trying to understand. And if you look at similar protocols, I, I won't call them out here, but there's lots of other protocols that are using this PTYT approach who are still struggling for adoption. Uh, and, and I'm guessing they're going to start to emulate some of what you guys have found success in. Also, to it's it's the usual story of um, it looks like overnight success to everyone else, but like you dig in and you go, hold on. So this guy has been building in the space since 2016, 2017. I'm betting there's others on the team who have such like, uh, you know, long roots in the space. And it matters. It matters that like you, you've lived through multiple cycles. Y you knew what to expect this bear market you knew to start to listen to those users um, and identify the trends that you could build off of. And, um, you know, even the LST narrative, like, sure, like, I think we're all grateful for the excitement around LSTs, but I think, like, you've clearly contributed to that and you found a way to not fight that trend and hook on to it, um, given the fact that you, you all were offering pools already related to staff, but... It, it feels so much smarter the way I've seen you frame it up uh, on, on Twitter and, and then educate uh, power users, KOLs, influencers who are actually talking about the protocol. But um, this is probably a great place for us to, to wrap up. I, I want to remind listeners that, um, first off, they should go to Pendle.finance. It's the best place to learn about Pendle. Uh, one of the really cool things is if you go into the documentation, uh, they have a Pendle yield trading handbook. That is so helpful. I've learned so much about the different uh, PT strategies and and uh, the uh, the yield token strategies that we talked about here today. Um, I also want to remind folks that they should uh, they should go and they should follow uh, TN on Twitter at TN underscore Pendle. More importantly, follow Pendle underscore Phi. Tian, I want to give you the last word then here. Uh, normally we wrap up with, you know, some alpha from our, our guests and, you know, I'll leave it up to you. Is, is there any sort of like alpha related more to the roadmap for Pendle that you'd be willing to share? Or I, I think it'd be uh, very timely to also highlight what might be your favorite strategy on Pendle or, or maybe a strategy that is less appreciated. 
I, I think in terms of strategy, um, my favorite one is super vanilla. And that's basically just LP into a pool of, of, uh, an asset that I think highly of. And for, for, uh, for me particularly, like it's, it's, uh, SDE because it's liquid and, um, I think it will continue to be the most dominant ETH LSD in the space. Um, with regards to the roadmap, too many, uh, but we will continue to push out product features. So beyond just looking at user experience simplification, uh, we also have tools that can help improve the trading activity. So I think simply put, right, it's Pendle Earn is part one, right? Because Pendle Earn is the PT aggregator and the it's, it's, it's a module to help with the distribution of PT to as many venues as we can. And, and then we need another site, uh, that automates the trading so that the relationship between PT and YT can remain balanced. Um, and then of course, like we have also announced that we, um, we are going on to mental and optimism. Uh, we have been fortunate to, uh, yeah, for, for, fortunate to have gotten the optimism grant. Uh, so we'll have to deploy on optimism in less than a month. So that, that's something that we're also very much looking forward to. Um, and, and just one more thing, right? I think, um, uh, this is something a bit more personal. I, I feel that whatever traction that we've gotten today, a hundred percent of that actually is a result of the team members. Uh, that we have, um, I can't take credit for like the learn page that, that you mentioned. I think it's a very, very, very good product to help with the education, but I didn't come up with that idea. Someone else in the team who is bright enough and, and bold enough to run with this. And we thought it's a good idea. So, so, uh, we decided to, to go with it and turns out it's, it's a really fantastic piece of educational material. And, and similarly, I think for many other features that we have incorporated into Pendle, um, it's a result of a uh, team. And, and I think as a figurehead of the Pendle protocol, I tend to get a lot more um, credit. But at some point in time, at some times, I, I wish um, I can also pass on that to, to my teammates. Tian, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, there's no doubt folks will probably sense uh, we, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to like walk through this protocol. It's a challenge because of the complexity of it. But if you go to pendle.finance, I think that's the beauty of the application, especially the, the simpler version of the application. It just dumbs it all down, walks you through, asks you questions along the way provides lots of FAQs. So per usual, I'd say the best way to learn is actually by clicking around or potentially um, using the application yourself. So um, anyways, thanks so much, Tian. Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you're a talented founder or developer, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod. <laughs>